now we can go on to the work energy. Oh, no, we can't. So now I have to define kinetic energy. That'll be fast. Um, kinetic energy is an amount of energy that an object has. It's not a change in energy. So remember, work was a change in energy. This is different. This is like, how much energy does that thing have at this instant? Um, so it's not a change in energy like work. We expect it to be related to the speed. And the formula is the kinetic energy of an object I'm going to call it fancy T um, is equal to one half times the mass of the object in question times the speed squared. And if you have the velocity vector rather than the speed, you can also think of this as one half times the mass times the x component of velocity squared plus the y component of velocity squared. Because the Pythagorean theorem, you know, the magnitude of the vector is the square root of the sum of the squares, you know. So, for example, um, bowling ball has a mass of seven kilograms. Um, and it's moving. Uh, let's say 10 meters per second. What's its kinetic energy? Um, the kinetic energy is equal to seven kilograms times 10 meters per second squared. So that's 700 uh, kilogram meters squared per second squared, and that's 700 joules. And dang it. Okay, and that doesn't have any direction because energy never has direction. It's not a vector, it's just a, an amount. Okay, but it tells you something about how fast it's moving. So now, a car? Yep, and it has a lot more energy. Um, and by the way, uh, you know, like the magnitude of momentum, this isn't exactly the same thing because we have the factor of one half and we have the speed squared, but like the magnitude of momentum, um, kinetic energy 
um, says how much it would hurt for, for the object to hit you. Um, feather, bless you, a feather moving at 20 miles per hour has less kinetic energy than a car moving at one mile per hour. And so it would hurt more to get hit by that. Uh, you can also think of it as like football coaches, I mentioned this with momentum, are looking for kids who can generate a lot of kinetic energy. You know, kinetic energy is how hard it's going to be to stop something. Okay, so you'd like to have a small kid who runs really fast is pretty good. A really big kid who runs really slow is pretty good, but a really big kid who runs really fast, that's what the football coach really wants. Yeah, because it's hard to stop them. Okay, so now finally we get to the work energy principle. Um, and this is general, <clears throat> which means that as long as there are no changes in thermal energy, should say no big changes in thermal energy. There are always some changes in temperature and the work energy principle holds. So in all the kind of problems that we do, the work energy principle, you can use it. You never have to worry about whether it uh, doesn't apply in this case. Um, and the work energy principle says um, total work done on an object is equal to the change in kinetic energy. It's so simple and So um, W total is the sum of all the work done on the chosen object um, and the change in temper, uh, sorry, that's not temperature. The change in kinetic energy is, um, you can think of that as the kinetic energy at the later instant minus the kinetic energy of the object at the earlier instant. Okay, so just see how much it changed, see how much it is at the two instants and subtract and that's equal to the total work. Um, okay, so let's say you have a block. Well, let's make it a um, let's make it a cart so there's no friction. Let's say that this angle is 20 degrees. Uh, 
and let's make the mass um, two kilograms. And let's say that this cart rolls down the ramp a vertical meter. Okay, so in other words, it starts at this spot, ends at this spot, and this distance is one meter. Start the test. What's the final speed? Now we could do this problem before. We could do it using Newton's laws, draw the free body diagram, come up with the forces, figure out the angles, figure out, um, you'd figure out the acceleration of the cart, and then you'd use the constant acceleration equations to, you know, you'd figure out how far it had to travel, use the constant acceleration equations to figure out the change in speed. But look how easy it's going to be using this energy approach. Um, So let's think first about what forces are applied. Um, so just a general free body diagram. I'm just doing this to make sure we don't miss any forces. There's a weight force of 9.81 times 2, so 19.62. And there's a normal force. Um, the total work is the work done by the normal force plus the work done by gravity. Well, this is a rolling or sliding problem, so this one always goes away. Okay, so all we have to do is figure out the work done by gravity. Um, weight force, that was this stuff. Um, so in rolling or sliding problems, the work done by the normal force is always zero. It's always zero. Okay, so the weight force is constant. And when you have a constant force, you can just calculate the work as the dot product of the force and the displacement vector. Right, remember that? So the work done by gravity is equal to uh, the weight force, zero, negative 19.62 dotted with the displacement vector. Well, we could figure out what the horizontal distance is. You know, we could figure out what this distance L was. But let's just put it in for now as L. You're going to see it doesn't show up. So we're just not, we don't even have to waste our time doing, you know, using trigonometry. So this is going to be L. And what's the, um, what's the Y component of the displacement? It dropped. Yep. So remember that displacement vector is fr the vector from the start to the end. So that's the displacement vector. 
So this has to be negative 1. And so that's 0 times L, so that L doesn't matter, plus negative 19.62 times negative 1. And so you get positive 19.62 joules. Yep. So what? Uh, we can just use the, so when we do Newton's laws on rolling and sliding problems, we always want to use that funky coordinate theory. And so then we have to use cosine and sine to figure out the weight. And that's just a tool we use because it makes stuff easier. With the energy methods, we're just going to use a regular coordinate system. A good question. I sort of glossed over that. So uh, in, in this energy approach, there's no reason to switch the coordinate system. So this is the displacement vector. Okay. So just think about the components of that vector. Um, it's going to go some, uh, you know, it's going to have some x component of displacement in the positive x, and the y component of displacement is negative one. You can think of that vector as you go one in the negative y direction, and then l in the positive x direction. Yeah, it's like the inclination is the inclination y. If it's going like that. Have like positive double w one, right? Yep, that's right. Um, so this is equal to the total work. Okay, and then the work energy principle. Says the total work of 19.62. is equal to um, the change in kinetic energy. And that is the kinetic energy, the one half times the mass times the speed at the bottom at the second instant, minus one half times the mass times the speed at the top, which we said was zero. And so this says that 19.62 is equal to V squared and so the speed at the bottom is plus or minus, I think that's 4.45. It's a speed so it has to be positive. So even though this was the first example that we, the first example that we did, and I was talking through it really slowly and whatever, it still took considerably less time to come up with that answer than it would have using Newton's laws. Like imagine all the steps of using Newton's laws. Um, not every problem is like that. It sort of depends what the question is asking for. Um, but there are problems where this can save a huge amount of time. Any questions about that? Yeah, it says that it starts at rest. So at instant one, the speed is zero. Um, now let's do a similar problem. Um, so let's say we have a 20 degree incline we have a block on the incline with a mass of two kilograms and 
it's going to slide down the ramp a distance of one meter. And now we have a coefficient of friction. So slides down the ramp. Uh, one meter vertically down, the same as before. Um, and the coefficient of sliding friction, kinetic friction is 0.1. If it starts at rest, What's the speed at the bottom? All right, well, go through the same process, and this friction is going to make things quite a bit more complicated. Um, <clears throat> so free body diagram, just to make sure we don't miss any of the forces that we have to calculate the work for. We have a weight force. We have a normal force. And the object's moving down the ramp, so the friction force has to be up the ramp this direction. And that's going to be the coefficient times the normal. Um, the work is going to be the work uh, due to the weight plus the work due to the normal force plus the work due to the friction force. The normal force still doesn't do any work, so we can get rid of that. But that doesn't mean the normal force is zero. So we're going to have to figure out what that is. Okay. So we're going to have to figure out the force of friction. So that's way, way worse. Okay, so how do we figure out the force of friction? Well, for this one, now if we're going to figure out the force, we're going to have to choose that rotated coordinate system, go through Newton's second law, do all that stuff just to figure out the force. And then we'll go back and do the energy stuff. Okay. Bummer. What? Oh, okay, good. I like your attitude. I thought you were going to be like, that's bullshit. I'm not doing this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, there's our free body diagram. Uh, so Newton's second law says... Um, negative point one n zero plus zero n plus what's the angle in that rotated coordinate system for that weight force? 20 past 270, you could think of it as negative 70 or well, you can use SOHCAHTOA with 20, or you can use cosine and sine you know, of 290 or negative 70. So 19.62 times cosine and sine of, I'm going to call it 290.
and all that's equal to the mass times the acceleration. The good news is all we need to do is calculate N because then we can just plug it in here to get the friction force. Um, so, um, the y equation says N is equal to negative 19.62 times the sine of 290. Can someone tell me what that is? And then the negative, uh, Sign of 290, yeah. Sorry. Uh, what was it? 18.4. Okay, and that's Newton's. And then we can plug that in. All we want is this. So all we needed was N. So the force of friction is equal to negative 1.8440. Now we're going to have to figure out the. Um, we're going to have to figure out how far it travels. Like now we need to represent our displacement vector in this coordinate system so we can use the force vectors. Right. So we need to figure out what this one is. So let's get the displacement in that rotated coordinate system. We know it's just going to be in the positive x direction. So we have a triangle with a height here of one meter. Um, this angle is 20 degrees. And we want to figure out this distance d. Um, so, uh, One over D is equal to sine of 20 degrees. So that D is equal to one over 0. 0.342. What do you get for D? Two point nine two meters. That was the normal force, and then our coefficient of friction is 0.1. Right. So we have to multiply the normal by 0.1 to get the friction force. Now the displacement is just positive 2.92 in the x direction, zero in the y direction. That's in the rotated coordinate system. Okay, well now, work done by gravity. We can do it by multiplying. Um, so what's 19.62 times cosine of 290? 6.71, negative uh, 18.44, right? That was the weight force. Dotted with the displacement vector. And so that's 6.71 times 2.92 plus negative 18.44 times 0. And you get. 
that should come out to just be 19.62 like it did before um, because it's the same displacement and the same weight force. This is the weight force in the rotated coordinate system. That's 19.62 times cosine of 290. And now finally, the reason we had to take this bad detour is the work done by the friction force is the friction force vector, negative 1.8440. Dotted with the displacement vector, 2.920. Uh, and that's equal to negative 1.844 times 2.92 plus 0 times 0. And what do you get for that? Negative 5.5. 3.8 joules. So the total work is 19.62. That's the energy added to the system by weight. Minus 5.38, that's the energy removed from the system by friction. And friction always takes away energy never increase the friction and have something take off faster, you know. Um, and so you get 14.24, 14.24 joules. And so finally, the work energy principle says 14.24 is equal to one half times the mass times the speed at the end minus one half times the mass times the speed of zero at the beginning. And so V squared is equal to 14.24. What's the square root of 14.24, 3.77 meters per second, and we want the positive. Okay, there was friction, so we expect it to be slower at the bottom of the ramp than in the case where there was no friction. And notice we got that. Uh, when it was just rolling, we had 4.45. When there's when it's sliding with friction, it's 3.77. Uh, let me say two quick things. Um, so notice, first, friction always removes energy. And second, um, problems involving friction often get much more complicated using an energy approach. Um, so as you're starting to imagine yourself 
um, seeing a problem that you could do multiple ways and trying to figure out the path that you want to take. With it. Um, if you see a problem that has a normal force in rolling and sliding or a centripetal force like a object, a ball swinging around in a circle, that you want that to make you think like, okay, maybe an energy approach is the way to go on this. If you see friction in the problem, that makes you think like that's sort of a, a strike against the energy approach. Often that's going to complicate things a lot. Any questions? Okay.